Welcome to, I don't know what this is, I'm Tim Wilde from Saints on Cinema, here with two out of the three G.I. Joeberg boys and Excess, and uh, this is not a G.I. Joeberg episode either. Um, this is just a wild interview, because I'm Tim Wilde, and I wanted to interview these guys about their playtime in the G.I. Joeberg world of their childhood. And with me again <laughs> is uh, Steve from G.I. Joeberg. Say hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. <laughs> I think uh, anyone watching uh, knows who you are. Hello, terrible. Steve. Terrible. <laughs> and this is my first uh, privilege to uh, to meet Rob. And before we go any further, I just want to I want to say, Rob. I mean, no offense by this. I just want to tell you why this is exciting for me because watching I became a, um, introduced uh, to G.I. Joe Berg you know, about two years ago. Follow a lot of things and then start watching or following the podcast, starting from the old episodes about I don't know about six months ago ish, maybe less. And, you know, right at the beginning, I was, like, trying to figure out what Rob's role was, what he contributed. You always had great things to say, but you're always the quiet one. You're always so pensive and collective. And I was like, where's this flavor? Because before, between every time you said something was, was awesome or fantastic, <laughs> and, and Paul <laughs> saying everything is so cool and cool and cool, between your those three words, um, Steve would have, like, a thousand words that he would throw into the conversation. I was like... Rob is so quiet. And then the strangest thing happened. I got to the, the Ninja Force episode and listening to your, <laughs> let's see, how do I put it? Your passive aggressive rant just absolutely destroying <laughs> those vehicles and the red the Ninja Viper and, the, and just like obliterating them with that same passive collective tone. I was like, I now understand Rob, and you've been so hilarious to me ever since. So it took me a while to get your personality, but ever since then, and then you left the show. I was like, oh, I miss Rob. You're so awesome. A year, like six months ago, a year ago, I never would have thought I could sit through an entire Rob episode. But when you came back and they had you that whole Rob episode, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. So I, I love, I love, I love what you bring to the show. I, I don't mean that in any offense. It's just your tone and everything. But when you bring it. That's how you talk, and I get it now. Once you get Rob, you're with Rob. You fly with him. Is that pretty accurate, yeah. Steve? <laughs> Is it? I think so. I Absolutely. Think... Why do you think you have to get him around? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean like it's an acquired taste. It's like I just it takes me a second to I get it. I understand Rob, and he's, <laughs> he's hilarious. And if anyone watching this hasn't watched the or listened to the Ninja Force podcast, that's a great one. Anyway, I mean, I mean, and... In the shadows of all their conversations, there was always this this looming presence of this phantom character from their past, Alistair. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen him until right now, and I said, assuming this is him, that's Alistair. And he's been on the show what once or twice. You're on G.I. Joeberg, right? Something like that. He he's also been of uh, invaluable assistance uh, <laughs> in making Blood in the Water, which was a play motion shot like around Alistair's home. Um, yeah, man. Hey, Al. The reason I wanted to do Mr. this... Mr. Stokel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one will know who that is on the from the conversations. Um, I wanted to have this discussion because I have just... I instantly fell in love with how much you guys, as adults, just still embrace and love the franchise of G.I. Joe and how much you guys play with the toys and are proud to be adults still playing with your toys to the point of filming it and then writing amazing narratives and then putting it on YouTube for all the world to to uh, stare at and uh, enjoy. And, and I wanna, I wanna kind of dive deeper into kind of how this worked as kids, because you guys will start telling like little nuggets of, of a story or an incident or examples of things that you did as children. And I was like, every time I hear little pieces, I'm like, oh, I have like a thousand questions because I'm so intrigued with that. Because I, as a grown, you know, four-year-old man still play with my toys. I mean, not as much as, as, as I used to, but all through my 20s and 30s, I still was playing with Legos. I mean, and I don't mean assembling them and putting them on display. I mean, play <laughs> with them. I still Proper buy play. Yeah, Joes and, and, I, and I still have fun with that. And for years, I was like, is there something wrong with me? Is this like some kind of a weird phenomenon where I have, have some like inability to mature? <laughs> No, agent. you were just born on the wrong continent. You should have born in, been born in South Africa. Is that it? You've been playing with us all these years. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it was just weird of me because I'm like, how come everyone else grew out of playing with toys in their early, even before teens, and I didn't? And I was still trying to buy toys and playing with my toys. 
And then I discovered your channel. I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not alone in the world. That there are still people out there embracing and still living their childhood. And and then the more you guys talked about it, um, I don't know any group of of people that can have so much of a relationship with their choi or their toys from their childhoods that they can do an entire episode about eBay purchases or Toys R Us purchase experiences and things like that. I'm like, you guys have just been loving and embracing this stuff and in your in your memory just collecting all this all these um, this identity of, of these childhood um, players for years and you're still in tap and in tune with that or you tapped in and I'm like I want to understand a little bit more of that. And so the point of this conversation is I wanted to talk to the three of you and I would love to have Paula in there, but but Paul's going to have a whole different story, a whole different set of answers. We could do that a little differently another time. But I wanted to hear from you three because you three are the ones that that played together as kids and I wanted to, to hear about that. So I had some questions. I want to kind of break down into it. I'm going to try and, and run through. I have a lot of Oh, just um, praise for you guys. I can regurgitate, but we're going to skip all that because just know I, I love you guys. I really do. I think it's really important. I was sharing with Steve the first time I, I talked to him how um, how I think it's important that you guys have connected so well with the, the spirit of what's good about this license, this franchise. And I think it's important. And I, I, it sucks that, that so many people, and it could be any franchise, but it's just you guys have connected with the most important part and you guys celebrate it you love it and you cherish it and you share it and i think that's really cool because there's a lot of people out there like me who can appreciate that so before we go into it i just wanted to kind of get a little bit just a really quick background of you guys as friends and connecting that with gi joe so i want to start with alistair al um because i hear them talk on the podcast so but i want to i want to hear just really quickly how you guys kind of became friends and like who was friends first and if you guys as friends collectively discovered gi joe together or if you each individually love gi joe and then that's what made you friends or how did that work how did you guys get to know each other and where did you discover gi joe uh well I'm, I'm, i met steve in uh pre-primary school uh you can probably correct me on the age but we were about three so it's <laughs> been a, a friendship that spanned three decades um and he introduced me to gi joe he was into it from the very beginning i was never really into it i've i've to this day never owned a figure really uh, i always played yeah i'm i was never a collector or the avid guy behind it it was always steven rob's toys so yeah uh, and then rob's a family friend of steve's and we just met as kids and <laughs> played games together Mm. That's, that's it. Yeah, I think Stephen had enough toys for all three of us to play with. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, and, was... and all the neighborhood kids. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Everyone come around to Steve's house. So that was one of my other questions: Was did you guys each have like a small collection that kind of became one giant collection? Because I have a mm. massive Lego collection that started as individual childhood friends that it slowly grew as it went from owner to owner, like National Treasure, the movie, right? It just got bigger and bigger and now it's in my possession. It's like eight different kids collective or collection that's in my custody. I thought mm -hmm. I was thinking like maybe that's how you guys may have been with your with your action figures. Cause when you with Rob and, and Steve, when you two are talking, a lot of times you're like, you had this and I had this and I had this and you but then you borrowed this and you always played with this and it really it all it felt to me like it was just a community pot of figures. Yeah, essentially I realized I didn't play so much on my own. Um, I really just play with Steven. So in the end, I was just like, just leave everything at Steven's place. Um, and he's he's got the better memory. So he remembers a lot better, like what belongs to me and what belongs to him. Um, I mean, I have most of it now. Cause I mean, when he kind of had to go overseas, he was like, you can have some of the stuff. I think it's, it's almost um, prescient because I mean, I mean, then COVID hit and then like, I, I would have no access to any of my toys at all. Um, yeah, so I just left everything in his place. I think right. some of it's still there, actually. Like my, my. Oh, <laughs> oh, no. no, whatever's still there is mine. No, it's your mom's. <laughs> so, Rob, how did you get into GI Joe? Was that also through Steve, or did you um, just do it separately? 
Well, I, I initially I grew up in KwaZulu Natal, which is a, a separate province on the the eastern coast of, of South Africa, and okay. I played a lot with um, He-Man figures and uh, what are they called, Thundercats, mm -hmm. and I got a few GI Joes separately, um, and they were probably my more fav favored toys. Um, so when I did meet Steven, I already owned a couple, um, and also Bionic Six, which was a similar scale. And yeah, I think just through him, then it was like, okay, GI Joe is the focus now. We're gonna we gotta focus on GI Joe. Let's just buy those. Um, and then so we it, did kind of go through a phase of superhero figures as well. But yeah, GI Joe was. I mean, I think he definitely influenced me and made me want to only collect GI Joe. Gotcha. So here's the this is the other question. When you guys were discovering GI Joe, was it through the the action figures before the comics? Because I know you guys, from what I understand, you guys discovered the cartoon much later. But was it the figures and file cards and then the comics or was it the comics and you got started buying the figures the story i tell is that absolutely it was the figures first um but i did manage to rent gi joe the movie which was pretty mind-blowing back in the day to see it animated right. but that dealt with a group of gi joes and cobras that were no longer available uh, right. for purchase so it was kind of a, a, an unfortunate tease um, in terms of create, like showing us the mythology of G.I. Joe, but none of the characters that we could purchase. So I'd say the, the, thing, the first kind of instructional uh, information we got in how to play with G.I. Joe actually was the Nintendo game that was really? released in 1990, for me at least. Yeah, so that was my earliest kind of like, okay, that's what you do with these toys. You kind of like, battle through all the cannon fodder and there's a boss and then you change to another environment and battle through all the cannon fodder and then there's a boss <laughs> like, right a very kind of video game-esque play pattern but gotcha. uh, once we got older and got more sophisticated then things got very interesting <laughs> okay yes um, well all right look T tim we we were playing well into our 20s <laughs> like that's how 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 crazy this this almost like i don't Dominic know this little cult that the three of us held so exactly. al you were still playing with them into the 20s as well not as much as okay. steven rob um <laughs> okay you know oh please <laughs> you know, life, life life happens yeah uh, so, things 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 change and i mean i also i moved out of cape, i moved away from cape town in my mid-20s uh, I've been living up the book, so just contact was to a minimum. Um, so yeah, so you just grow apart, I suppose. Right. Just curious about that too, Al. Do you do you feel like uh, if you had been still local and still close with these guys, you would have been like all the way like into it as much as they are still like on the podcast or anything, or or do you have this like, well, you know, there's other more important well, things in life than celebrating this toy franchise. No, no, no discredit for G.I. Joeberg. You don't just have no, to no, no, no discredit to what <laughs> Stephen and Rob and Paul have done with G.I. Joeberg. I really enjoy it. I love watching the stuff on YouTube. But That's yeah, I, I don't think I would have been as into it as they are. I wouldn't have been a member of G.I. Joeberg, but I think I would be a little bit more involved if things hadn't worked out the way they had. That's awesome. Okay. Well, I, mean, I know you're... Uh... Your, your name comes up a lot in this show, so it's, it's even behind the scenes, you're still, your, your name is still <laughs> in front of the camera as well, um, or at least in front of the microphone. All right, so I want to get down into a little bit more of the of your actual playtime. So this is my curiosity, and I, and I re-listened to, I think, your 100th or 200th episode where you guys went into some little partial stories, but I want to kind of get an idea because I would say that, as I, as I mentioned, your your fandom is just so so praiseworthy and so thorough that you guys can remember. And, and Rob, you just indicated that Steve has such an amazing memory that he can recollect all this stuff. He remembers so, it for us, so we don't have to. <laughs> you, don't have, you, can read, you can switch that brain power to like comic books and other things, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and Stallone and Schwarzenegger movies. <laughs> um, but uh, so so I don't know. Maybe Steve will kind of kind of guide some of this from the the archives of your collective memories here. But I want to go back to kind of how like how would a, a week of playtime with you guys as kids work? I, my curiosity is things like, did you take turns being like the game master who was in control of the narrative? Did you did you like how? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that 
for the lap. <laughs> Sorry, I, I got a laugh there because uh, probably 99% of the time, Steve was the game master. Um, it was a rare occasion that, that uh, Rob would take the, the lead and even rarer so that I would do it. Um, for, us, it was just, for us, we were just given a bit of a miss of like, pick a dude, pick some guns, and we're going on a mission or something to that effect. Okay, yeah. so let, let's start with that. So Steve, sorry, I'm bumping my camera here. Let's start with that. So Steve, when you would, if, if you guys said, did you guys say like, okay, Saturday, my house, noon, we're going to start. And then you would start preparing narratives and scripting and start building your v VHS tape <laughs> dioramas and all that stuff ahead of time. <laughs> Did you have to say like, hey, you bring? I need you to bring these toys here. Or it sounds like everything was already at your house. But like, to walk me through a little bit of that preparation process. I think during the week, I would uh, ideas would germinate about sort of just vagaries of like a story. Like, I'd love to have a scene set in a nightclub, or I'd love to involve this character, or I'd love to do a power drop in like a, a giant uh, jungle environment so these little snapshots of of scenarios that i wanted to play would be the starting point um hand in hand with that was also like what era of gi joe are we are we situating ourselves in because for a time we we tracked the the new releases quite closely like when the new sculpt gi joe's arrived uh, and the Devil's Due publishing comic was was the hot news. I kind of wanted to play with those figures and those scenarios. Um, for instance, Devil's Due did a kind of a reinstated situation yeah. where G.I. Joe had disappeared a, for seven start, years. And sorry, I don't want to interrupt your, your story. I just want to just, so you guys know where I'm coming yeah, from. Maybe. That is the point where I got into G.I. Joe. I had a few figures here and there as a kid. I remember I watched the cartoon movie as a kid. Not many episodes. I remember the Rise of Prentorus Arise story and everything had some of those figures. But mostly my introduction to the real G.I. Joe universe was from those toys and that comic book series. So that's that's kind of where I injected. So that's really interesting. Go on, Steve. I'm sorry. Oh, well, I, long story long. Um, mm -hmm. I think our most uh, involved storylines came out of the period just after the Devil's Due stuff. So after we'd all graduated high school, uh, we actually created a universe separate to G.I. Joe. I mean, it, it had its roots in G.I. Joe, but uh, we, we kind of created a what if scenario. Mm -hmm. Like what if Cobra had taken over North America and somehow walled the United States is a kind of an isolationist um, nation and and kind of <laughs> basically held it in its thrall. Uh, but there were three characters that tried to overturn this and they started to uncover a covered up story, sort of the legend of G.I. Joe, like this this freedom force that, that once once opposed Cobra and has now become an underground movement. Anyways. Like I said, long story long, this was eventually a dimension skipping um, plot line that I think must have captivated us. Like all told, probably like a couple of months only, but it was a couple of months of intense, like every weekend, Rob was coming around, Alistair who lived two doors down was like very quick behind and um, <laughs> Typically, we'd play after dark, like when the house was quiet and and we had the run of the place. We would play into the early hours. So usually indoors? And out of doors. Fortunately, mm. uh, my folks' place had a nice spacious garden in the front, a garden in the back with a swimming pool. Um, and there were interesting little like back passages, like there was a, a, a section between the sort of one back wall and the the neighbor's perimeter wall and that formed a kind of a i don't know a very ramshackle place filled with rubble and weeds and old bricks that was fun uh, but the lounge the lounge was infinitely pliable as like if you wanted to make it an outdoors environment like if you wanted to make it a desert you just turn all the lights on and the carpet kind of has a a brownish 
tan-ish uh, mm. hue to it. And the, the, the couches were all brown, so those were mountain peaks. So, yeah. Or you could make it an indoor environment by like using a, a cooler lighting scheme. Like, <clears throat> like this. Right. Hey, there's your nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, so yeah. is, this, is this the same home that you went on your the the infamous uh, defiant um, op or box opening <laughs> when you were going around gathering each of the the guys that were in their own nooks doing their thing? I think Rob was sleeping. If I remember. Yes. <laughs> is, that was absolutely that's right. Home. And okay. correct. And and the lounge that I speak of was where we chose to do the, okay. the unboxing of the defiant. Gotcha. Yeah. So that was a crazy story. I just got back from overseas and we went straight into that thing. I love that. That was, that was a fun episode. That was the first time I kind of saw the group together. That was the first video I saw, at least with you guys. Okay. So, so going back a little bit. So I did have a question for you, Steve, about that, because I know how very, very anal, and I appreciate this because I have an OCD mind as well, how anal you are about the scaling. Were you equally OCD about crossing over different eras or years of G.I. Joe? Like, like, did you play with like Ninja Force and have them running around with characters that died off earlier in the actual canon? Or did, was it just whatever, whoever characters you just played with them? Or were you very strict on this, the narrative of the actual storyline of who was in, involved in the stories? Like which Joes existed with which Joes? I, I think I was certainly less OCD about separating eras. But then the toys themselves created these divisions. So when it was the new sculpt era, all of a sudden those guys looked a little bit out of step with the classic O-Ringers. Yeah. Um, so we played with them as our core group and then used the other guys just peripherally, but never as our leads. Um, and then, you know, new products started popping up. Alistair, for instance, really embraced the like generic power team elite figures because they had right. wrist articulation and thigh articulation and they looked good. Um, uh, like that's crazy because it, uh, clearly one man's trash is another man's treasure because <laughs> typically G.I. Joe fans are very quick to, to relegate that sort of thing to just like cannon fodder or filling up the background um, or just using the vehicles in fact and tossing the figures completely. But uh, oh, yeah. Alistair didn't mind, he loved to embrace uh whatever tickled this fancy even if it kind of stepped outside of the uh the typical but uh it's speaking of typical I, mean, I think toys, there was always <laughs> <It's true. laughs> hey, and, and another thing i'll give those generics is they were very durable so i think Al alistair had no like fear the, like shoving like all the guns and... in their hands yeah <laughs> yeah no it's no broken to hold a gun <laughs> okay. yeah so, so, so we, the... we definitely did kind of just to answer the question, I mean, we, we definitely did move through the eras and kind of adopt new things as they they appeared. This mm. OCD of mine is is a fairly recent thing. It's more of a collector hang-up than a playtime hang-up. Okay, that's interesting. And, and, um, and scaling, we could rip the roof off with scaling um, during our kind of our, our dimension hopping adventures because if we suddenly wound up in Eternia, that's how you explain the fact that everyone is you know, a little bit bigger and a lot yeah a lot wider <laughs> okay that makes sense so um so so walk me more through the preparation you would have an idea earlier on in the week you start thinking about how you wanted the story did, did did al and rob did you guys always play the same protagonist or did you guys did 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 he start did steve start telling you guys kind of maybe what the adventure was going to be and you could decide who you were going to play did he assign who you're going to play mm -hmm. How'd that work? I think mainly, I mean, it depending, at least initially when there weren't like big stories, like the, the shifter story, or eventually when you, when we started playing a Marauders storyline with the, the new sculpt uh, core figures, um, it was just whoever you felt like playing with. Um, there was no like specific characters that he was just like, you know, choose one guy and then we'll make him work within whatever story I'm, I'm coming up with. Um, fortunately, Stephen wasn't strict about the stories. I think he had some idea of where he was going, maybe, but you kind of were just along for the ride. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, especially with the shifters one, I mean, there was a specific character that you came up with initially, where we kind of like, um, I suppose, kit bashed the, the characters. We kind of like made them into our own figures that to, to play with, so they were our own specific characters. Um, yeah. 
so i mean it, it just depended on what we were doing at the time like who we were going to play with but he knew you were always going to be scoop and sounds like law and order is that right <laughs> pretty much <laughs> or, or beach it <laughs> or beach yeah. it gotcha okay so well so... Steve, Steve was the same it was always it was always shockwave or or shockwave or shockwave <laughs> <laughs> Always his favorite, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think within within canonical like GI Joe strict GI Joe games, of which we did play a few, particularly in the early periods. Yeah, it was a scoop, law, shockwave, split. Uh, once we started doing these more creative, uh, I don't know, endeavors where where it wasn't kind of a, a mix, more of a sci-fi mix, so it felt. You know, we used GI Joe toys, but it felt a lot like a lot more like Star Wars or an episode of Star Trek. Um, that's where we kind of diversified a bit. Gotcha. Uh, Alistair actually kit bashed a beachhead figure um, to make his his avatar on that one. So, Steve, would you start? <laughs> when would you start the setup process for your nightclubs or your the mountainscape or the the bases or the whatever infiltration? Like, would that start? the day they show because you mentioned in one of the episodes that you would have them like tuck away into another bedroom while you did the setup or did you start the setup prior to the day the day of the battle yeah rob awesome. and i spent a lot of time tucked away in bedroom <laughs> yeah together alone it was awkward i don't i don't want guys get playing, to. Each other. <laughs> <laughs> playing with our toys yeah right what's your boys doing in there playing and with each other I, I, Steve's out there playing with G.I. Joe together, and they're playing together alone <laughs> in a bit. Whatever. Well, Tim, you, you pretty much uh, uh, nailed it, man. Like, yeah, I would kind of do it on the day, basically. Um, unless unless it was a game that had kind of had percolating for a long, long time. And there were a handful of those where I'd kind of done pre-prep during the week, like things that required set pieces. Um, but if if the game basically was just like us battling our way through swaths of of enemies in various different locations and in various different kind of um, what would you say action set pieces so if there was a sequence that required driving to have appropriate vehicles <laughs> in a position to be stolen and then utilize so you'd like lay out um, vehicles like along the couch or whatever like whatever you had set up you'd start just put them out there sure and it wasn't just limited to one room i mean we tended to really monopol monopolize on the real estate like fortunately my folks place operates in kind of a, a circuit <clears throat> so you can kind of just almost endlessly have chase sequences down down passages and through an alleyway and then through the kitchen and then round again um so we had ample um racetrack so in the evening say. you would have this stuff and then and then up. And you would have, and you'd, and like, your, your mom would go get like a glass of milk or something and like be kicking <laughs> over like your, your vehicles and everything. Would you have, and would you have like figures like, like Cobra troopers, like, like leaned up against vehicles, like in a standing upright position where they just like laying on the carpet where they would be? Like, how did you set up characters like that? Cause that kind of stuff. Very is good detailed question. Right yeah very interesting i think i think if if i did that our setup time would just multiply um and, and we're already kind of against the clock because these were pl being played late into the night i had to worry about robert and alistair's like attention spans it's like <laughs> <laughs> i mean typically alistair was the guy who was like ready armed like about out the door and i'm like wait l i, I just need to like you know put <laughs> up some things for you that. to shoot we have to get to the popcorn of um, the movie at so, the end so, of the night. Come on. Well, there's, there's, there's a matrix line that I think of a lot when it comes to uh, my game style. Uh, it's guns. <laughs> Lots of guns. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. So, so the I mean, enemy, the I, I, enemy, I forget the, the opposition. Line, but I actually had, a, I had used a Star Wars droid as my gun robot. It just followed me with all my guns on it so I could change out whatever, whenever. <laughs> <laughs> he awesome. was ahead of his time, man. Drone, drone warfare. Yeah, uh, Tom Clancy, um, advanced warfighter. They use those. They call it a mule in the game. Oh, yeah. 
So, Steve, would you even have the figures laid out before, like, as they came into the room to start playing, or would you just like introduce them as you went with like a limited, like, because this was long before your troop building era, I'm sure. <clears throat> I think it. We we had sort of boss battles, perhaps, that I had laid out ahead of time. But let me tell you, Tim, at one point, in terms of the rank and file cannon fodder, sometimes I went as far as not even arm them. You know, just just pretend they have guns because right. to give like two dozen Cobra troopers, not that I had two dozen Cobra troopers, but you know, I had a ramshackle bunch of Vipers. Yeah. Uh, the core were great kind of like terrorists. Um, so these guys would just be the guards or assault forces. And they, would, you know, if I needed an instant like action scene, I would just kind of dump out a whole bunch of them and like <laughs> manipulate them, manip manipulate them in turn primarily to fall to, to Alistair's uh, hail of gunfire and <laughs> Rob to, to, to film and thing. And so you're sitting there... <laughs> so that kind of worked itself out pretty well. And they're already laying down, and then and then Alistair it's comes just, in and just blows them away, and they just, you like, set them up and <laughs> drop them right back onto the carpet, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, <laughs> when you say it like uh, that, I'm pretty sure that we're going to sound very sophisticated at all. Yeah, but we can't, we all have an imagination. Yeah, we we're can't. never worried about the guns in the end, because Alistair had all the guns, so... <laughs> <laughs> So this is another question. If you did introduce guns into their hands, when you were setting up, or even your own characters, did you worry about having the guns like in there like the whole time? Because my problem when I would do setups for my own, I'd have big, huge, colossal battles in my living room. And I'm talking about in my adulthood. <laughs> I would always get, it's tedious to arm them like you're saying, Steve, and I didn't have a, a time clock. Um, but I would, uh, or not, you know, I wasn't on the clock, but I would just, I'd have a hard time setting them up with their guns because I didn't have enough imagination to <laughs> pretend they were armed without the guns. And it took a long time to set up my battles. And then it would take a much longer time to, to put everything <laughs> back because now you're organizing. So my question, when you would arm them, one, with those older toys without the, the gummy grips, were you worried about them snapping fingers, like being placed with a weapon for a long duration of time as you were setting up or playing? Does that make sense? Because they would, because that I would always have that problem. I didn't want to stretch out my hands or break the grips. I, well, this this is kind of like really tracking our ascent into being old men, uh, but it never used to be a concern to us. Like, like the thumbs, maybe because the plastic was younger, the thumbs did seem to have a bit more give. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes, I mean, you'd be you'd be pretty fearless with most grips. I think some weapons were off limits because they were just like, how would a guy ever hold that? That's way yeah. too thick. Um, but but almost like it was almost coveted to kind of stretch out the thumbs a little bit, like get a guy with really relaxed thumbs. And that that was something that could happen if you were just, I suppose, incremental about 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 how you inserted things, um, you know graduate from something thinner to something thicker um but yeah it was never concerned to me that guys were having their guns in their hands for prolonged periods of time i mean you'd be horrified to know that sometimes guys went back into the toy box like machine gun not only with the guns the hand, in their hands but tucked under the elbow, <laughs> but tucked under the elbow it makes well, it easier for next time when you play yeah you yeah know? Cause they keep the guns in their hands especially the core figures that will just permanently the guns were in their hands yeah so even now, Steve, when you I mean, you did your video showing your, your collection, Paul did the same thing. And, when, and there's a lot of guys that have their collections where the guys are just up there posing. But then you talk about these are the same guys that you'll play with. Like, is there a, is there a concern of preservation with them with, without with displaying them with their weapons that you're not going to be able to use later that it's going to break, especially with your childhood shockwave, you know? I mean, you, you brag about that thing all the time. How do you... Uh, it's, it's... I'd be getting so nervous. But it's he's also warning. Like, I, I have, well, exactly. I think that has a lot to do with their durability. Like, I am far more precious about new purchases that are coming to me, like <clears throat> almost dead mint. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to put a gun in his hand. I don't want to <laughs> take him outside. I'll get the paint scratched. Yeah. So the guys that are battle tested and worn are less. I'm less precious about those guys. Um, and at the same time, I am precious about them, but I know their tolerances. Like I know that I can manipulate the leg and it's not going to snap. I can, you know, manipulate the head and it's not going to crack the torso. Yeah. Whereas 
you know, I've recently been buying like swivel arm guys, and those are terrifying. The 1983 version 1.5s are just yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Stressful, man. Stressful. <laughs> it is. Like I mentioned, I started buying some of these based on just a lot of discussions you guys have and some of your reviews. And I'm like, once I get the the weapon in there, I'm like, I don't want to. This isn't my childhood toy. I don't want to touch it. But I buy. I don't buy these things mint. And you've indicated, Steve, when you buy them, you like if there's, you know, discoloring or broken issue or pieces or something like that. Because then you're not. You don't have to cheat them so fragilely. Um, Alistair, do you still have your Law & Order and your Beachhead as a, as a kid, or did you always borrow Steve's? Like, <laughs> did you have all that? Uh, like I said, I never had a figure. I think I once never found had. an avalanche, <laughs> and he was missing and all. But in the house, I found it somewhere <laughs> random, and I was like, I have a G.I. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another but Just question. going back to the previous thread on the conversation, but no, just going back to the previous thread uh, with Steven and posing and hands and something you need to understand Tim Steve was like beyond Yoda level of Jedi Master when it came to figures and posing and getting them to stand and getting guns in and out of hands you know I was struggled to get something bright and then he does it in less than a split second he was really yeah. good at it it was just a mm -hmm. seasoned thing I yeah. think that when he talked about that week of setting up I think that week he played through the game and his uh, physically a few times <laughs> before we got there on the weekends. He was just so good at manipulating the toys. And you can see that in the in the films that they shoot now as well. It's just like a lifetime art, basically. Yeah. And Steve, you mentioned that in, in one of your com in one of the conversations on your show that you, you were I think you were teasing mm -hmm. Paul maybe or you were or teasing someone else that they were like couldn't get to bend right or something. Like, no, you guys were mad and I am too. Like I mean as a kid I could I could move like three or four guys in one hand even before I had my big man hands, you know in moving like in motion not just like duh, 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 but have them like stepping like with my fingers able to to maneuver and grip and direct gunfire everything like i and have sword fights epic battles with kicks and slinging swinging weapons and everything all with my fingers and i was like i was i was really good at that as a like, still i am but um it is a talent like i said Alistair, that that comes over years and years of playing with and i'm not surprised at all that uh, steve <laughs> <laughs> was able to just quickly throw together, throw out a collection and set up a big battle. Um, this is a t two questions that came out of what you just said. One, I, I, you just ahead. reminded me of something that um, um, I would be insistent <clears throat> that if our guys were sneaking through a jungle, you couldn't cut to the end of <laughs> the, 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 the sneak. You had to physically get onto your haunches and manipulate the where they hide and through this jungle move. like this is part of the game guys you're so supposed were to you take time with this and, were and you... i mean even as as a late teen and an early 20 something you know the knees start taking a bit of a, a pounding from from being so low for so long but yeah. i would be insistent like no your guy can't fly <laughs> so right. he's got to walk yeah, that, that's where you get those, those pants with the padded knees for when you're down on your knees. <laughs> you guys are like carpenters or painters or plumbers. You guys are playing with G.I. Joe's in your BDUs in the backyard. So were you maneuvering like Cobra sentries and stuff while they were sneaking their guys and they had to like wait for you to look the other way? Was it that detailed? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, think I think when we, when we got into a later stage where we literally had to cut through <clears> thousands <throat> of cannon fodder, that's when things got a little bit loose. But uh, but yeah, if I was still in the, the the real serious setup phase, I'd have Cobra sentries in in places. Yeah. Okay. So so two questions from Alistair just said one is he was mentioning. Well, you mentioned like some of the characters. Did it bother you? Because this bothers me whenever I watch the cartoon. It bothers me a lot. Does it bother you having like cold weather characters with regular casual characters with desert characters all sitting in the same vehicle in the same battle? It's like you're watching like these Arctic fighters in their Arctic clothing fighting like in what you set up as like a desert or urban environment or something and to me it's just ridiculous i you I, who was it was it iceberg who was your first one of your, your first arctic characters steve that you bought that you always talk about 
the iceberg. iceberg. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, mm -hmm. a character like that, a, in a, except for like having cool accessories like skis, <laughs> it's like I I've never understood the appeal of the, and I have a bunch of them now, but I never understood the uh, the appeal of like cold weathered fighters because you're always fighting in like a jungle or desert type of the t traditionally environment it's just like they're they're out of place and they're <coughs> targets wearing complete white clothes did that ever bug into your your childhood ocd or is that is that just me because i can't stand watching the cartoons when you have them all wearing their, their they look comical look they're dressed like that in a tomahawk with a desert guy and a surf and a snow guy i think eventually well, it really oh, I think you wanted you yeah <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure. It's, I'm sure it's been talked about a few times in your 200 plus episodes of podcast. When we would have our favorite character, and then it's a, a series of different missions over a couple of weeks or months, and Steve takes us to different locations. We actually made clothing for our Joes to wow. to get them to go to like snowy tundra and that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to brag about it, but Rob's was the worst. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I put any effort into it. It's probably like a hole in, in the cloth and I put it over and it's like elastic bands. No, dude, you, you, you just, the just wrapped him up with like a strip of white fabric. <laughs> like a mummy. Oh, yeah. I probably used like tissues as well. <laughs> Real creative. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah um, the, the, we, 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 we did pay attention to that sort of thing. Like Dusty would not go to the desert. Uh, to the to the to the snow, for example. Um, gotcha. He was used for urban or desert things. Yeah, that kind of stuff bugs me in the cartoons. I'm like, I get this is the character and that's their specialty, but it's ridiculous having them. But that's just me. Um, that's cool. You guys would do. You would actually incorporate the the terrain with what what garb they were wearing, and you guys would customize. That's really interesting. Now, did you guys get into little fights of like, I shot you, no, I shot you first, kind of a thing? Like Steve would. <laughs> have a good mm. character down and you'd be like oh no I think, I think this is where i'm gonna just end the chat i'm gonna go okay cool <laughs> no, dude. Pleasure, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be you don't want to be crucified no, there were definitely no there were definitely many a moment many, many. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me about some of that drama. I, I'm really curious. What because Steve is as a game master tr you traditionally or I guess you know normally he would be letting his characters fall but was there was there little debates between I mean, and I'm sure Robert was just walking around filming <laughs> all of Alistair's like just brutal murders like <laughs> is that pretty much <laughs> no th those days were way before filming. <laughs> I mean, Thank cool. goodness. I'm talking about Scoop. Scoop walking around. Oh yeah, no, 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 I, I, I would just go around making jokes the whole time. Really, this, <laughs> the, the, yeah. that was my function in games. Yeah, Rob, you, Rob, you were definitely the funny one, breaking the tension a lot. But there were a couple of moments when uh, toys were thrown to the floor and people walked out the room and we just then the sat there. Had. Okay. Really? Yeah. I'll go home now, bye. Wow. <laughs> I, I, okay. Because a character died? Because, because a character because a, a, a character was um, a kind of a, a, a main villain and I tried desperately to cling to some kind of internal continuity. So if you killed Major Blood last week, he's off the table. There's no more Major Blood in this universe. So I, I, I kind of made up contrivances that were like, no, no, he got on a jetpack and blasted out the window. And Alice is like, well, I just riddled him with a machine gun. Good luck with that, you know. What's this jetpack made out of that it can withstand, like, this onslaught so you know there were moments like that that, that kind of caused a bit of friction that's fun but then also yeah. um there was one instance where i was I, I had the inspiration to have the joes um uh accompany a, a diplomat this is actually inspired by a, a, an old marvel comic gi joe marvel comic that they would escort a high value person of interest um to a location but one of the Joe team members, in fact, turned out to be a, a traitor and was the assassin embedded in this team. And that kind of pull out the rug from under you moment really did not sit well with Al. He's like, no, <laughs> but it speaks to the level of like, yeah, we can like laugh about it now. at least it, <laughs> we can laugh about it now. But, but it, 
I love to make this example because it speaks to the level of like involvement that we had in the story, the inner life of these characters. Like, like I yeah. did go into to uh, performance and drama as a career choice. Um, Rob and Elle did not, and yet we were all seriously invested. At that point, I think, you know, you couldn't hear a pin drop. Like the tension was so high. And then this guy reveals that actually he's the traitor. How do you respond to that? Well, Elle responded by saying, no, fuck this, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. Uh, but so, yeah. It, I it did was, want to ask about that. How, how involved was the role playing the, among you guys with the different characters? Were, were you were you like throwing out your little childhood and teenage voice acting skills, like just playing, just role playing out the characters? Or is this just something that came, or did you, were you just playing through like a video game as you've described it before? No, there was voice acting. Became very involved. <clears throat> yeah, yes. I mean, as much Even, as the action um, scenes, there was at... the in-between stuff, yeah. Well, oh, cut scenes and stuff. There were, so... there were attempts, attempts at uh, speaking foreign languages or some kind of like approximation of foreign languages. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, some kind of faux fo Russian. But uh, <laughs> Rob, you made an interesting note there that like we did play the, the in-between stuff. Like if I was kind of dragging my heels in terms of the the setup for uh, you know, action, there'd be a sequence where we're just on the transport plane, having a dialogue amongst each other, in character, um, yeah. and those almost were were more interesting. Well, they, they were definitely more interesting to me because I wasn't just putting up pop up targets in front of L. Um, <laughs> and I I don't know if those were were necessarily interesting for you, L. Um, it depends. Maybe it depends. I mean, I know with Party Crack, it's very movie esque feel to the games, especially in later years as we grew up and evolved and we got influences from different things and just matured in general. But I, I do appreciate what you were doing in terms of the just the static dialogue. Not, it doesn't have to be all guns blazing all the time, as right. much as I did enjoy it. And that that was one of my questions. Now, Steve, you blew my mind one time in your in your podcast when you said that you were much more invested in in conversations and like the debriefing scenes and everything more than the actual combat itself. And then my mind, this is where one of the many reasons I wanted to talk to you guys about this. Like that that is so cool to me that you had that you even had a debriefing scene. Like so many kids wouldn't <laughs> even bother to cut right to the action. But like that you would have a setup, have a debriefing, have a mission, and then I was gonna ask, did it cut right from there to the action, to the dropping, or to the infiltration? Or do, I was gonna ask if and you just answered, did you guys actually have conversations in, in cockpits and and um in um in in hall or uh you know, whatever the <laughs> the belly of the whale, all that stuff. Like, did you guys do that? So you had that dialogue, but how, like, how detailed was your was your debriefing sequence of that? Because that is that is so cool to me. It depends. Um, <laughs> wildly varies uh, from game to game, but sometimes, like, yeah, it was essential to to bring the guys up to speed, at least on where my head was at in terms of what the objective was and uh, what kind of personnel were tapped for the mission and what our in, in insertion method were was like th that just built the excitement and kind of it it served to get us in the right frame of mind i think if we just cut to the action it uh it, it wouldn't be not nearly as immersive um, yeah. but if you built the world if you not only had the briefing but then also had like the the truck ride to the 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 the, the, the airstrip the same, and, yeah. and then boarding the plane and then you know, a little bit of a scene playing out in the aircraft, and then the para drop. Then, by the time you hit boots on the ground and you were slogging through that jungle, <laughs> you did so with a <laughs> smile on your face, didn't you, boys? <laughs> uh, no, but because the, you, you kind of were fully what immersed. This, what you're describing there also, I have memories. I don't know the details of it. Maybe you would again with a better memory. But that's transport from briefing to plane then the flight whatever you also used it maybe two or three times as a way of unveiling a new toy that you'd gotten and very proud of and we didn't even know about it, it was a surprise. <laughs> that's awesome like a new jet or a new helicopter and we came into this room for the first time that day and there's this new toy and we're gonna board it and go on a mission that's, i think the tomahawk might have been one of those that's super cool i, I think uh, that's true yeah 
I didn't have enough imagine even playing as, as I grew up it was always I would set up my my headquarters and I my favorite because I never had the original um, command center but and I never appreciated it until I saw it in person I still don't have one but it, how big it is I thought it was a pretty simple and boring design but I love that whatever the 90s the the command center whatever with the falling tower and everything that thing is mm. awesome but I would always just set up this thing against like an ottoman and like a, the wall, and that would be like it, I would have this kind of a, a, a from Lord of the Rings a Helm's Deep kind of engagement that this was the the fortress and it would just be about penetrating and fighting through and that base is awesome for that kind of a setup, but uh, that's all it would be. It would I would always be as as unimaginative as it would just be a simple military base and maybe a couple commanders would be there like investing or just uh, do an inspection or whatever with a couple of select joes and then cobra would do his big attack and take it over and then joe would have to come in with all of their power and come in and and take it back but through all that setup i would never get through the actual battle because i would <laughs> get preoccupied oh. or run out of time before the actual big battle but i like steve had more fun with the setup and the infiltration part and the takeover than the actual big battle at the end which playing by yourself is just so much that's <laughs> because i would have my every gel i had out there but i that's that that i did that same same campaign over and over and over i didn't have nightclubs and <laughs> <laughs> all this kind of stuff and reveals and hangar bays and stuff so i i love that i love how how involved you guys were um it's uh, I don't know if you, cool sorry tim i don't know if you play video, uh, much video games xbox or playstation or something but if you can imagine the way call of duty and medal of honor run between actual gameplay missions those the movie sequences yeah that was the kind of thing that steve set up you know it was that knowing getting to know the character he would pose questions to to get the dialogue going and we just had to make stuff up and yeah. develop our mm -hmm. own character so okay and i know I, I know we're running out of time and steve has to go but like did you guys start formulating your characters in your own little narrative or did it start as you became more exposed to the comics and other things did you start kind of playing your characters more to the way they were presented in those um, other mediums mm, good question tim uh, personally i think obviously we injected a lot of ourselves into these characters so i wouldn't say they necessarily i mean shockwave is a blank slate <laughs> law has very little if any uh comic book appearances and cartoon appearances i mean there's the film but i think alistair you you saw the film long after you'd kind of really adopted this figure so law was you uh, um the yeah, movie uh, had... i was more into that pure military look I wasn't into the different colors and the neon vipers and the whatever. I was mm. more into the realism and I would try to bring that across in my gameplay apart from mowing down a hundred guys in a second. <laughs> but did you have did you have a, a template for his character? I think that's that's the root of what we're trying to get to. Like was there a, a, a an actual film from star? A, from a no, from a personality point of view it was it was me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be true, yeah. And it sounds like that was the same for you, Rob, with Scoop, just being sarcastic, just Yeah, it was just me the whole time. I mean, I would take it seriously most of the time, so we'd, we'd really get into what Steven was on about. Um, and it was always cool, because, I mean, it's much better than kind of just constantly assaulting one thing over and over again. That's, I think, what kept it going for so long, you know, into our 20s, is that there was always a narrative, there was always something interesting and new to kind of keep you interested and want to keep playing, because you weren't just playing the same thing over and over. Um, but no, definitely, I mean, also depending on the game, yeah, that we, I think we basically created our own characters rather than kind of basing it off what was being presented in, you know, any other media. Um, and then, yeah, then I just make a whole bunch of jokes, so. <laughs> so having just said that, Rob, how many times did Scoop die and after having just said that and adopting this uh, narrative? Story? I don't think any of our characters ever died. Never died. Um, no. we, we survived the entire way through. I mean, other characters might well, die, but I mean, that's because Steven wanted them to I, die. I, I would kill my character off well because of something that Steve did that irritated me and that sucked <laughs> yeah, it up. Yeah, that's true, though. <laughs> so you start off and that's Go fine. Yeah. Like, literally, you <laughs> were just like, fall over dead and I will cut the room. <laughs> that happened a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. Equivalent I want to kill this guy. Let him be kill him. So, so Steve, I, that was the other question too. So, on on the other side, with you playing most of the antagonists, did they? Was it all just like Cobra Troopers and like just non-specific characters that would would die as casualties of Al, or would just would real characters start dying, Major Blood and other people? So we, for a time, drifted. <clears throat> 
away from Cobra being the antagonists at all. I mean, they, they uh, I, I guess we, we kind of had a thirst for realism uh, later on and the gaudy uniforms of like the, the ramshackle vipers that I had didn't do it for us. So we shifted the, 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 the villains to uh, the core and they're kind of more muted color palettes um and actually made made it the war on drugs because uh <laughs> the core were a bunch of sort of like drug lords yeah from, south american uh, from drug down lords, south yeah. oh come on exactly. carlos do what <laughs> the scorpion yeah with a k <laughs> with uh yeah, the scorpion man, with the we... k. it was a headman that he's a, that's kind of his world too right isn't that a isn't he a drug never player? had a headman figure and didn't have mm. much exposure to the character either i think it was a real flash in the pan in the comic books and yeah. uh we didn't have many of those issues to hand so, so playing with playing with the core gave you less attachment that you could just kill off these characters yeah and i suppose be more magic but the problem well, with, with cre- holding beholden to a, a pre-established narrative yeah that's true what were you gonna say Steve? So, well, the problem I always had was I, I would then go go ahead and make them named characters. Hmm. <laughs> um, but once again, I'm, we're talking in two different eras here because, yes, the core did eventually become pure cannon fodder. They were just like military looking guys that weren't Cobra um, for us to, to fight, whether that didn't mean, yeah, mercenaries or Russian soldiers or whatever, whoever the, the kind of the third faction bad guys were. But before that happened this in this kind of like south american drug lord campaign um all of the core members we had at that time were named characters and they were unique individuals and they were preserved and survived mission to mission mm. and became this ongoing antagonist yeah i think over, over i mean we played essentially almost over two decades um 20 years i mean there's a lot of stuff that we did that changed a lot and, and that's what kept it interesting, kept us playing, I think. And the popcorn at the end of the night in the movie it was always worth worth waiting for. <laughs> We're, uh, so just to we'll wrap up, because I know you guys, got, I, I could go on for hours asking, because I'm just so intrigued with this. <laughs> I, I should have been some kind of a psychologist that focuses specifically on childhood <laughs> toy play. Childhood toy play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One did uh, was so it always... we could talk for hours on the subject. Yeah, honestly, like we're, this is we're basically just always tip of the iceberg um, here. Maybe rehashing the mm-hmm. same points because because we're always just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, like I really should maybe chronicle this stuff in writing somehow. I you know if it would be so fun to walk through to the best of your memory of a speci- like a campaign or just a story that you did and. And it would be so fun to kind of walk through like how that went. And you guys remember because I know sometimes like you may not remember if I asked like Rob or Al or even you, Steve, about a specific sequence that maybe individually you guys couldn't remember all the details. But as you guys started talking about something, it would start and things would start clicking and memories would start coming out. That would be mm. a really fun conversation for you guys trying to like taking something, trying to work work through it. And I bet you a lot would, would resurface from that. Um, but was it always just the realism? It sounds like you guys, when you started doing like interdimensional <laughs> fighting He-Man and dinosaurs or whatever, and Terminators from your <laughs> from your stories too, um, was it was it always the realistic military like bullets and and like frag grenades and stuff, or was there ever blue and red lasers in your imaginations? Was it always just true to the realistic side of it? Uh, it all depends. I, really? I mean, I can't remember which which. Um series of games it was but we were, it was a sci-fi thing and we each had our own spaceship or two spaceships i mean i, I chose the thunderclap as my spaceship and it was this fast moving like a rapid firing <laughs> cannon it was ridiculous <laughs> wow <laughs> with laser guns i'm i'm for i would never have thought that that you guys based on your stories would have would have been playing with like the almost the cartoon imagery in, in your playtime it would have mm. been more the realistic side of it that's interesting uh Tim, Tim, it, it got it, it. It it went even further. At one point, we were super powered, <laughs> and so we would we wouldn't even bother with weapons. We you kind of just have this there. kind of super speed. <laughs> yeah, you use martial arts. This is Matrix very though. heavily heavily mm-hmm. Matrix inspired. Um, Matrix. I, mean, I was gonna say, was this the Marvel toys that stirred this up when they came out their X Men line you've talked about, or was this like Ninja Force? Mm-hmm. 
characters, but you're saying no. Matrix inspired. Wow. Much later. Yeah, so as late as, as 1999, we were kind of kit bashing Joes to kind of look more Matrixy. Like, I, I obviously, one has this obsession with like all in black. Um, so that, that, that became a thing. Like, the darker palettes, we, we kind of skew more towards figures that had darker clothes. Um, and, and obviously, martial arts played a big role, and, and sword play. Like, who needs a gun that can run out of ammo when you've got this sword that can just cut down thousands of, of cannon <laughs> fodders? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we didn't have to worry about them getting blunt. That wasn't a concern. That said, this is the tip of the iceberg, and I'd love to, to continue this sometime, you know, if that these gents awesome. can make themselves available again. Let's, yeah, let's, let's do it. I would, I would love to try and do a, a breakdown of, if you, if you could, maybe you could think about that, Steve, if there's a, maybe a, a story that you that you think would be the strongest to try and to remember and kind of relive in discussion i would love that if we, we go through and kind of break down what you guys remember and just kind of go through the phases of your of your adventure if that if that would be fun i, th I mean for me it would i don't know why <laughs> that would be for you guys straining well, to remember that uh, no may maybe not this shifters sort of alternate universe maybe i would pick um something oh. more rooted in gi joe yeah 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 that's what cool so something from marauders would probably be quite a, a good one i think but yeah Tim, which, this has been the awesome with, which was the one when rob's character was the guy renegades renegades was that renegades R Rob, uh, Rob's that, that, remembering it as Marauders. Oh, Marauders! I keep putting it Marauders. Okay, that's <laughs> Renegades. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think you're thinking of. Um, yeah, that, that uh, was one of the Galaxy, 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 mate. Right? <laughs> Let's we had do to that. go across the zipline from a building to a building or something, and Steve and I have got our characters going upside down, hand over hand, leg to leg, and Rob's guy just like <laughs> walks across like a tightrope. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love, I mean, I love everything that you guys do on G.I. Joe and I love the support you get from Alistair, obviously, and, and, and they always have fun um, um, noting and acknowledging Al from their childhood stories. It sounds like a lot of fun, but it's almost, it's them just remembering how fun it is. It's like it's an inside joke for them that we're like, it's great. So I, so I don't know, I must be awesome to be able to get him <laughs> to come to a discussion with me because you can barely get him on Joe Berg. <laughs> well... Thanks for hosting us, Tim. This has been an absolute pleasure. And 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 maybe to cap things off, the reason GI Joburg exists is fueled by this nostalgia. Absolutely. So the, the the foundations that we were 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 creating back then have made memories that have kind of propelled us to to keep this passion alive. So that's how strong these play sessions right. and how, how important the memories of them were right. to us um, mm -hmm. yeah no this this is my happy place gents yeah bar that's, none that's why i appreciate you guys and especially your your collective memories of this so much because i was a you know as a child of two navy parents i moved around a lot as a kid so like my little collections of friends like could never hone in on one specific franchise like this i think ninja turtles was my biggest um, you know, thing because I was living in one spot during kind of that that the heyday for Ninja Turtles, and and that was a lot of the fun I had. But I mean, I had little memories of playing with other things. But I wished I had been in one place long enough to have such a lifelong friendship like you guys have that had 20 years of playing with these things and enjoying them. But in my case, probably all my friends would have grown out of it long before you guys ever have or probably ever will. So I love <laughs> diving in. To, to what you guys have have had as friends because it, it's something that's really cool to me and it's really it's an interest and uh, I yeah I would love to to come back and talk more about it but I really appreciate you guys joining um, me and Rob and Alistair it was a pleasure meeting you guys you guys are awesome um, not to not to steal Rob's Rob's favorite word <laughs> and this has been well, it's fantastic. awesome that you you enjoyed having us it's fantastic Absolutely. yeah thanks so much guys. <laughs> So anyway, thanks, Jens, and I'll let you guys go on with your your day slash nights, wherever whatever you're doing. <laughs> I think and, it's night uh, time for me and Al. It's what's yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's morning for you, Steve. Here. Yeah. Oh yes. Finally, thanks for the sacrifice and and the collaborating, guys. It's been fantastic, and we have many more cool, questions. Jim. Revisit. All right. Yeah, I look forward to it. I hope you have a good right. weekend. You too. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Yo, Joberg. Yo, Joberg. Just guys. <laughs>